Coffees in downtown Seattle. I'm Ursula Royteen. From Woodenville to Westlake, this is Cairo Radio 97.3 FM. News and talk powered by the Pacific Northwest. The Dory Monson Show on Cairo Radio. This is the big lead. Coming to you from the Carter Subaru Studio, streaming on Facebook Live. Jam-packed day. Let's get right to the big lead. The big lead. Top story. About two years ago, Dave Ross invited me to come on Seattle's Morning News. And the topic was, when did things get so divided around here? When did people around here, Seattle, start becoming so acrimonious? And I think he was shocked when I gave him a very specific answer to that question. I, without hesitation, I didn't know he was going to ask that question. Without hesitation, I said, oh, 1978 is when everything started to turn in Seattle. And I'll tell you why. 1978 is when the Seattle School District implemented a, an incredibly poorly thought out busing program. Then and now, Seattle was driven by a bunch of social ideologues who would do things that felt good without thinking through long-term implications, which is exactly what we continue to do to this day. We do things that make us feel good, even if they're not doing good. Now, thankfully, I graduated from Ballard High a year before that. But I still lived in my Ballard neighborhood, and I saw little elementary school kids who lived on my block, and they were, all of a sudden, they were getting bussed an hour and 15 minutes to go into South Seattle. South Seattle kids, exact same thing, would sit on a bus for more than an hour each way to go to their new school. And that produced some catastrophic implications for our city. Number one, families didn't want their kids riding on a bus for two hours a day. So families left Seattle in droves, fled to the suburbs. And with that, school spirit just vaporized. It vaporized. At the high schools, you'd go to a, a high school basketball game and there would be maybe 12 kids in the stands because parents weren't letting their kid from, you know, who lives in the Chief South neighborhood, they weren't going to let them drive an hour or 40 minutes on a Tuesday night to go watch South play Ingram. Just wasn't going to happen. And so school spirit, and the Seattle schools, believe me, I'm a product of the Seattle schools. And they were no great shakes when I went there. But the deterioration of the schools was pretty dramatic. And the Seattle schools continue to have tremendous problems, the biggest of which being that they are far more concerned with social justice issues than with education. I mean, it was an extension of the whole busing thing to begin with. We're going to do things not because they're doing best for the kids and their families. We're going to do things because they feel right. Continue to have that mentality. So families fled, and Seattle is always battling San Francisco as the most childless city in the country. Now, when all of the families fled, you know what else vaporized besides the, the schools? Churches. Because it was people of faith. You know, generally, and, and I know this is true for me, my strength started to deepen when my wife and I had kids, and, you know, I understood the value of faith in my life. I'm not proselytizing. I'm not telling you your life is, is any less than mine if you don't believe as I do. But for me, that was my reality. That was our, our family's reality. And that's just the, the fact of the matter. So the churches, and we are the most unchurched city in the country. 
Fewer people attend church in Seattle than any major city in the country. Okay, so 1978 is when all of that started to happen. Our schools go bye-bye. Our churches go bye-bye. And we've replaced it steadily over the last 40 years with what we have now. So, Modson, why are you bringing all of this up today? Well, the Seattle Times has a piece that I find incredibly interesting. Seattle area residents are the least likely in the United States to give their neighborhood a top mark. So what uh, Housing and Urban Development, HUD, what they did is they did a poll in all the major cities in the country. And they said, scale of 1 to 10, what do you give your neighborhood? You know what percentage of Seattleites give their neighborhood a 9 or a 10? 37%. Compare that to Miami. 51% give their neighborhood a 9 or a 10. Boston, 49% love their neighborhood. Raleigh, North Carolina, 49%. Uh, They did this in 26 major cities, and Seattle came in dead last. So let me ask you a question. If you are so dissatisfied with the city in which you live, why in the world do you keep voting for the same type of politician that has caused what has been a steady. I've been watching this for for 50 years. I mean, when I was a little kid 50 years ago, uh, I at least was aware of where I lived and what, what was going on in my neighborhood. And so for 50 years, I've been watching this. I've been watching a city that, not just my opinion, the opinion of the masses. If you're not satisfied with your neighborhood, well, that's a pretty huge part of your life. So why, for 50 years, have people here continued to vote for not only the same type of politicians that have caused this erosion, this level of of dissatisfaction, but we're going even more extreme, where Marxists are on the city council. It was like, okay, liberals what put in busing, but they're kind of mainstream liberals 40 years ago. And, and that just destroyed everything in the city. And, of course, Seattle School District abandoned that and got back to the council. But, but here's the crux of it. The absolute focal point of any family's life is collectively, I mean, all of our families, our neighbors together, It's either your school or your church. There just aren't that many other galvanized, where everybody's pulling together and everybody kind of can get on the same page. Regardless of where you are politically, socially, everyone wants their kid's school to be great. People at a church are like-minded and often engage in some collective philanthropy and and fellowship. Those are the two things that galvanize people. And those are the two areas where Seattle is last in the country. Most childless city, most unchurched city. So it follows that the people live in Seattle. And by the way, if you are, and maybe you're part of the 37% who love your neighborhood, good for you. And I'm sure you do wonderful things and in, with your kids' schools, those of you who are still in the city with kids. But this is just a consequence of a path that started about 50 years ago, and we went from liberalism. Now we have a Marxist on the city council. We have avowed Marxists who are vowing to replace the council members who say they are not going to run for re-election, and things will continue to decline and get worse, and we'll keep important drug addicts, and we'll keep having politicians who view getting our money as more important than the lives that are that are dying on our streets. 
the drug addicts we import from around the country, so many of them have raped women, have killed people. But it's all part of, you know, this Marxist, you know, let's destroy from within. Which is an avowed declaration of Kashama Swant's party. And now members of her party say, yeah, we're going to run for city council seats too. We got to destroy from within, tear it down, and then we'll rebuild it in our Marxist image. That's what's going on. And people are unhappier with their neighborhood in Seattle than any city in the country, according to the Seattle Times piece. You get what you vote for. Up next in the big lead. The big lead. Your tax dollars at work. And this isn't surprising, but a major poll has been done of both Seattle and King County residents. And again, the Seattle Times did this. I want to give them credit. And they found out in this poll that by a massive amount, People are against more bike lanes. They are against tolling the roads. It's just deeply unpopular around here. 70% say they either oppose or strongly oppose a toll to go into downtown Seattle as a way to reduce congestion and raise money for transit. 70%. Jenny Durkin is continuing to embrace that. And this is another example of taxation without representation. Because if you live in the suburbs, if you're one of those people who's been forced out of the city by all the craziness here, you don't get a vote on the city council. You don't get a vote for mayor. And they want desperately, you know, Mike O'Brien said it a year ago, if people are too broke, too poor, too destitute, too low income, too working class to afford the tunnel toll. And they tried taking surface streets. Well, we'll just toll the surface streets and get their money that way. Which I consider to be a soulless, evil way of politicking. To tell people who are too poor to afford the tunnel toll that we will then toll you driving on the streets. But as I may have mentioned once or twice, when you're a Mike O'Brien, born in Clyde Hill, attend Lakeside, attend Duke, have never wanted for anything. You know, use your connections to help your wife's business. You've never wanted for anything for one second of your life. It's real easy to go after the poor. It's real easy to go after the working class. And so... 70% of people strongly oppose a toll to go into downtown Seattle, and this is still the ultimate dream of Jenny Durkin, to get a toll. So it'll be interesting when our representative government, if they pursue something that people have said, we don't want it, we don't like it, we can't afford it. They've talked about somewhere between $10 and $20 a day to drive into the city. And this gets back to my first topic. If you're one of those suburban parents and you want to be active and involved in your kid's life and you want to coach their, their little league team, you want to get them to piano lessons, you simply mass transit doesn't work for you, for your life, to be the kind of parent you want to be. If they go for $20 a day, that's $5,000 a year that they would take from families to transfer to the control of, of Marxists on the city council. But that's what Marxism is all about. Yeah, we're going to watch real closely to see you know, what the response is now that they've got some definitive polling. Next up in the big lead. The big lead update we're hearing from another family member of that 16 year old boy who was shot and killed at the walmart down in renton over the weekend yesterday i played you clips from the grandma who said that he's 
just a wonderful kid. My grandson was a good child. He come from a good family. Whatever happened down here, I don't know. But he wasn't involved in no kind of gang crap or none of that stuff. He was a good kid. He was a good kid. And this is her second grandson lost to gun violence within the last year or so. And all this violence needs to stop. It needs to come to a freaking end, and I'm so tired of it. The the kid I mentioned yesterday, I saw on the news, I don't know what year it is, but it looked like a, a somewhat late model Mercedes four-door that the 16-year-old was driving. They say that he had somebody in the car. The family claims it was a car transaction gone bad, and whoever was in the car with him shot him in the chest and he died. We're hearing from his grandpa now as well, Cedric Walker Sr., talked with uh, Cairo 7 News, our news partners, and the 16-year-old lived with Grandpa. My grandson was my best friend. Talented. Talented, very smart, very bright. And the, uh, just absolutely heartbreaking. There's just nothing more heartbreaking in life than losing a child. Grandpa's hoping for some answers. And so I get a call from his, from his stepdad. Told me Marion's dead. I was like, what? No, he just was here. You know, I'm, got, I'm trying to be strong, but I just want, I want answers. I want answers. I want somebody to come forward about my grandson because he didn't deserve this. And then Grandpa told Cairo 7 News something I had not previously heard that was, uh, was very interesting to me about the grandson. We're just broken, you know, because he has, he has two kids. I mean, if there's anybody in this, I mean, you pray for the entire family. And they're, they're all devastated. But this 16-year-old was a father of two. And pray for those kids. That, that's just, it's so incredibly sad. And it's, it's a cycle that at some point in every family's journey, got to stop. I know a little bit about what it's like to grow up without a dad around. I know more than a little bit about it. And thankfully, I was able to find the right path. But it's, it's so hard. And not only to not have a dad who's around, but now in this case, the 16-year-old father of two is dead. And pray for those two. I wonder how old the kids are. I wonder how old he was when he first fathered the kid. I don't, know, I don't have that info. I wasn't able to find any info on how old his two kids are. But uh, that's, a, that's a young dad. And that is your big lead. The Big Lead on Cairo Radio. Yesterday we covered in depth one of the most shameful weekends in memory for the media in this country. And I have a lot of new information on those Covington High School kids whose lives were turned upside down by despicable legacy media in this country. The latest on that story coming up next as we get rolling here on the Dory Monson Show.